Hello, my name is Edwin Rutsch and I'm the director of the Empathy Center located here in beautiful Santa Barbara, California. The center's mission is to build the empathy movement and to raise the level of empathy in society through education and community building initiatives. And my name is Anita Novak. I teach at McGill University and I'm the author of Purposeful Empathy, a book that invites readers to turn up the volume of empathy in their lives. And at the beginning of 2024, Anita and I co-hosted the Empathy Summit uh, brought to you by the Empathy Center and more than 40 authors of books about empathy participated. They shared what their book was about, why they were motivated to write it, and what they hope readers will take away. Thank you so much for watching, and we hope you'll buy their book. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our next speaker, who is David Levine. Um, and he is the founding director of the Teaching Empathy Institute, where he is, uh, specializes in professional and leadership development, curriculum and program design, and implementation, group facilitation, and systems change. He is the author of Teaching Empathy, a Blueprint for Caring, Compassion, and Community. Help me welcome David to this summit. Thanks, Anita. Thank you so much. And thank also to Edwin for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, in 1989, I was walking into a school in the South Bronx in New York City. I had my guitar. I was about to teach a lesson and facilitate a conversation on social drama. And I use music, I use songs that I collect or that I write, sort of in the same way you might read a book to students, where you read the book together or read the book to them and you talk about the characters, you know, the story, can people connect to the story, to the life story of the people. But I use song. And I was gonna sing this one song that I always would do in those years. And I walked in with the guitar, it was the first time I was with this group and this uh, eighth grader raised her hand and she said, are you gonna sing self-esteem sing-along feel-good songs? And it was kind of an amusing question, but we then had a little bit of a conversation. And the essence of it is she said, or she, she told me, um, please don't give us advice. Don't tell us what to do, but ask us questions. And don't give us answers, but listen to us. And she then in her own way said that each person in that classroom, in that community had their own story. And she said, you seem like a nice guy and everything. But the reality was that I wasn't living their story, but I was there for them and with them. And so I really said, I'll do the best I can. And she said, thank you. And then she said, oh, and by the way, if you want, you can sing a song. So I sang the song and I'm going, not gonna sing it because of our time, but I will recite the lyrics because it's the essence. I call this the essence of empathy, the experience of listening to this story. It's a true story written by a friend of mine named Lee Doman. And it's about a seventh grade memory that came back to him 20 years later. So I'm gonna recite the lyrics. It goes like this. Most everyone I knew put the whole gray family down. They were the poorest family in our little country town. Howard always looked too big for his funny ragged clothes and the kids all laughed at him. Jimmy Jones would thumb his nose. Howard sat across from me in seventh grade at school and I didn't like it much but my mama taught the golden rule. So when the spitballs flew at him, I never would join in. I guess that was the reason Howard thought I was his friend. And after things would quiet down, sometimes I would turn and see the grateful eyes of Howard Gray looking back at me. Howard Gray, Howard Gray. Somehow they got their kicks out of treating you that way. Well, deep down, I kind of liked you, but I was too afraid to be a friend to you, Howard Gray. And one day after lunch, I went to comb my hair and saw they had Howard pinned against the locker in the hall. They were poking fun about this big hole in his shirt. They had his left arm twisted back behind him till it hurt. Now to this day, I can't explain and I won't try to guess just how it was I wound up laughing harder than the rest. I laughed until I cried, but through my tears, I still could see the tear-stained eyes of Howard Gray and they were looking back at me. Howard Gray, Howard Gray. I can't believe I joined them all in treating you that way. I wanted to apologize, but I was too afraid of what they'd think about me, Howard Gray. Now from that moment on, after I made fun of him, he never looked my way. He never smiled at me again. 
And not much longer after that, his family moved away. And that's the last I ever saw or heard of Howard Gray. And that was 20 years ago. And I still haven't found. Just why we'll kick a brother or a sister when they're down. I know it may sound crazy, but now and then I dream about the eyes of Howard Gray looking back at me. Howard Gray, Howard Gray, I've never quite forgiven us for treating you that way. I only hope that somehow you'll hear this song someday and you'll know that I'm sorry, Howard Gray. We'll probably never meet again. All I can do is pray. May you and God forgive us, Howard Gray. And I sang that song and I'd been doing it for about three years at the time. And I turned to a sheet of white chart paper, blank sheet, and I would always write the question, why are people treated this way? And in that moment, I know an earlier speaker said, it doesn't come from the cosmos. This did come from the cosmos to me. This vision, this visual empathy written inside of a picture frame appeared before my eyes. And I wrote it almost as if I was instructed to write it. I had never thought of teaching empathy as part of these lessons. It never had come up. This was a long time ago. But I asked the students, what does this word mean? And people had certain definitions, you know, that comp someone said walk a mile in someone else's shoes. Someone ran to a dictionary in those days, looked it up in the dictionary. But this one boy, this was in an eighth grade class. This one boy, he said, you know, we did a class trip recently to the, um, to the Met. And he said, the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, Museum of Modern, Metropolitan Museum of Art, one of those museums. But he said, empathy is like going to a museum. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, when I was in the museum, I saw all these beautiful paintings by these incredible artists. And I got to see through their eyes what they were experiencing, not just what they were seeing, but how they were feeling when they were seeing it, how they were perceiving it. And I was able to feel what they were feeling. I wasn't painting the art, the piece, and I wasn't living their story, but I was being invited in to experience almost like I was in a little room with them and they were explaining to me and I was honoring their story through the, by, by honoring and appreciating their painting. And he said, everyone in this room, we all have stories. These stories are our little museum rooms. We all have paintings and we need to honor one another. And that's what empathy is. It's not, you know, feeling what someone else is feeling. These are my words now. It's being present with another to invite their story in, to tap into it, connect to it. Because when our stories are honored, we can be vulnerable. And when we're vulnerable, we, our hearts are touched. And that's what caught us on, that's what courage is. Empathy to me is a heart skill. And in that moment with that student and with that class, I knew this was what I was to do for the rest of my career as an educator, as a facilitator, as a speaker, and as an author. And I ended up spending three years traveling around the United States, meeting with teachers and parents and asking, can you teach empathy? Is it a skill? And I have come to the belief that as adults, it is something we can teach by modeling. We teach it by modeling it. And after those meetings and those conversations and the continued dialogue with kids, I wrote this book, Teaching Empathy. And now there's a newer version called the field guide to a school of belonging, because that's what, what it's evolved into. The teaching empathy book is in four sections. The first one is teaching empathically. The focus, the wisdom of touching your heart, having empathy for yourself, and compassion for yourself as a pathway to touching the hearts of others. The second section is teaching empathy, which are essentially pro-social skills, creating the conditions, making dialogue a core instructional discovery practice. Dialogue is not discussion. Discussion is concussion. Dialogue is collectively exploring an issue. And this empathy skill of high level listening is the essence of dialogue. It doesn't mean we're here to agree. We're here to understand and honor where you are, your story. That's part two. Part three, I call living empathy and that's creating the culture within our school, culture the way we do things called the school of belonging. And in these times we're in belonging is so critical People are feeling so disconnected. We need to connect one another by creating the conditions for empathy, by creating emotional safety, honoring stories, belonging is longing to be and inviting the story in with honor. And the last section of the book is called Courageous Conversations, which is my version of what I call music dialogue. 
Now, five people will be sent a copy of this book, and I'd also like to send five copies to this, and I'll, I'll figure out the logistics with Edward and, and Anita. But just to close, my hope for this book and for this work we all do, especially as it relates to young people in our communities and our schools, I quote, sociologist Martin Brokenleg from the Lakota Rosebud tribe, who said, when we're under stress, we go where we belong. And I feel that wouldn't it be awesome if school, classrooms, our communities were places where we belonged, where we could be, where we could honor one another as we honor ourselves. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share. I really appreciate it. Thanks, David. I think uh, I can speak for all of us on the call that we sense your passion uh, through the Thank Zoom. You. It's really special, uh, especially as an educator.